quiet on the edge of the chaos filled with pleasure I will be the air That feels helpless. It feels empty and lonely and that every turn is going away from you and everything that happens is not going your way and you feel alone and it, it really can feel like nobody understands what you're going through. I think one of the the big, you know, the biggest demons that I battle with with my mental health is anxiety. People understand anxiety because everyone's been through something that's been stressful or they've been had a period in time where they were excessively worried about something. But anxiety is, it's like this constant buzz. You wake up and you're already concerned. Like you wake up and you're concerned about something. It's, it's, it's this constant assumption of the worst that not, that wreaks havoc on your central nervous system. You're not just thinking the worst, you're feeling it. And it is, it's a physical feeling. And I've spoken to other people about anxiety and everyone feels in a different way. For me, it starts in my stomach, it sits in my stomach and my throat. It's a tightness, it's a kind of a churning. So what does that do? It means you're on edge for a longer period of time. What does that do? It just gives you more and more reason to be anxious. So yeah, like, I mean, I could talk through specific instances and I could talk through specific things, but as a general, like, general way of describing what it's like to have anxiety that would be it it's just this low level buzz this constant itch that you can't quite scratch this prevailing sense of uncertainty around everything i just like i remember i'd rock up to the gym i'd go to training and i would walk in 10 minutes later i'm like i have to leave or there would be a point where i would just sit in my car like drive all the way to work or gym whatever you want to call it and i would sit there couldn't go in and just like drive away because I just I wasn't in the headspace to be able to perform or to be myself or be around people it was just it was consuming like all consuming and it was something I just thought about all day every day you know you wake up in the morning and it's the first thing you think of it's the like last thing you think of when you go to sleep no matter what situation I was in it was always in the back of my head no matter even if I was in a a really happy environment. It's just, it's, yeah, it's like a real overwhelming feeling in that like no matter what you do or how much you train or whoever you're spending your time with, it's just that kind of thought that's always, just always there in the back of your head. Yeah, it's uh yeah, it's, it's not easy to talk about. Like Yeah, it, it took it took me a while to finally talk about my mental health and I think that there were some situations in which I tried to express how I was feeling and maybe didn't feel as if that conversation went well or didn't feel like it was accepted that I was feeling sad and upset. Just that idea too, that like, that men live this life where they feel like they can't talk about anything and especially with others. And, you know, as men, like we, we should have each other's back. Like, I, and I don't know why we don't, like, I don't know why, why so many men are, are quick to be like, oh, well, you just need a man up. You shouldn't feel that way. You're, it's silly that you're feeling emotional. Like, you know, everybody's feeling emotional, whether you want to accept it or not. Like everybody feels these emotions and um, and I just think as guys like we we don't feel like anybody can relate to us and we don't feel again like we don't feel like our problems are enough to really bring to the table but like why can't we talk about it everyone's conditioned to be resilient everyone's conditioned to be tough and to kind of just get on with their life I think especially within Australia as well we have a little bit of that culture that you know she'll be right and just kind of keep moving and then I think specifically when you're talking about men's mental health, we also have the additional conditioning of masculinity in the sense that we do have to have this front and we have to be men. And that's something I think we oversee is just, yeah, this, this idea of what a man is supposed to be can be quite damaging. 
it's such a, a, ma a masculine environment and I always was too afraid of, of opening myself up to the boys because I was scared of you know being mocked or, or something like that in the change room and I think that's when I, as I got older in my career I was really trying to be that person for younger players and, and um, be there and you know ask those questions that old, older players wouldn't ask me because you know I wish I had someone that was there for me doing that but yeah I, I definitely was, was, was too scared to open up. I don't think I wanted to believe that there was anything wrong with me, anything that was actually different about me. You know, my whole life I've wanted to fit in, wanted to just be like everyone else and to be part of the, the group of whatever group that I was hanging out with. And so the idea of kind of even exploring that was pretty scary. I think people are afraid to really look deep within themselves and to figure out if what's going on because if you find something you don't like, it means you've got to actually work to change it and to look within and to kind of realize there's something fundamentally that you want to change about yourself that requires a lot of effort and a huge commitment and that's scary because it's just easier to keep existing you know I think there's I don't know who said this or I heard it but it's like we will choose familiar pain over uncertainty even if uncertainty may lead us to feel better You know, with mental health, a lot of times you see that like it's you know sometimes words and, and things that you want to say to somebody else like might be too late to say that you're not gonna have that chance to um, you know to to share what it is that you're feeling and and maybe that means that somebody else doesn't get the chance to share what they're feeling. I guess suicide as a whole is a really hard thing to wrap your head around because there's often not an answer. But suicide aside, also I've seen it manifest into drug addictions, substance abuse, you know, other forms that are really damaging to one's life uh, because you internalize it and then you project it and you pick up habits that are really bad for yourself. It's as a form of escapism. If you don't speak about it, it's going to take another form and it's going to be either damaging to your life or it could end your life. Like it's just something that it can't, it can't be kept in. The first year retiring, that was quite tough. Being like unwanted for the first time in my career. I wasn't wanted by, you know, the club that I put my heart and soul into and that was pretty tough to take and I, I didn't deal with that really well. I held a lot of anger in for a long time. And then, you know, building a business in, you know, in the height of, you know, the pandemic wasn't easy and being a father of three doing that um, and having three you know humans rely on me four humans rely on me was was quite tough and there was points where financially it was pretty tough so it was like um, there were times where I was <clears throat> sorry yeah financially there were times where I was um, struggling and, and thought that I thought that um, it'd be better that I wasn't here and, you know, my kids were um, financially um, looked after. And that was probably the, the toughest, um, toughest time. Um, just having so much um, financial pressure. Um, That was, that was a tough time and I knew I'd make it out the other side and making it out the other side, I'm just like, I'm so grateful now in my life and I think gratitude for me is so important because, you know, I'm grateful for what I, what I do have now and after, you know, kind of hitting rock bottom, I kind of realised, you know, there's no, like, the only way is up and everything after that moment I was kind of just grateful for. The relationship we have with ourselves is for a lot of reasons the most important relationship that we, we can have and we can build. 
and for me like it was just so bad and i think this is you know something that you know the double-edged sword of self-awareness i spent so much of my time at that point in time just rigorously taking inventory of everything i hated about myself everything that i thought i was doing wrong everything that i thought made me a terrible person and all i did was i was so hyper focused on that i was constantly writing about that i was constantly seeking confirmation that I was this horrible person I felt like I was at my core and you can only feel that way about yourself for I guess for so long before you start to entertain some pretty dark things because it's this noise man it's this all-consuming noise when you feel that way about yourself it is this all-consuming noise and there's no off switch there is numbing and there is distracting and there is maladaptive coping but all of that just adds to that noise and makes you feel worse and that's where i was I was adding to that noise in everything that i was doing and i just got to that breaking point where i was like well how can i just switch this off In any situation that you're that you're given, you do have such a big support crew, and there are a lot of people out there that love you and that and that want what's best for you. But it's hard to feel that at all times, especially whenever the road feels really dark. It's funny because it feels the same way. Like, you know, I'm obviously sitting here holding back tears, and that feeling of like just crying and just letting go and yeah, just, just, just feeling it like that's, that's what I think that the first conversation that I had really opened my eyes to is that like, I am worthy enough to feel sad and I am worthy enough to feel these emotions. And I think a lot of times we struggle with that and struggle with the idea of being enough. I think then the biggest thing was actually opening up to my coaches and my teammates more so, um, and really just explaining how my mental health at the time was affecting my ability to be the best athlete I could be. And um, that was a really difficult conversation because I couldn't fully contextualize it at that time. I didn't have an explanation. It was just something was really wrong and that I, I couldn't overcome it in that moment. Um, it's a lot for anyone to kind of sit there and just be like, this is fully me and this is everything that's going in, on in my mind because it's a feeling of like nakedness and vulnerability that you don't really experience otherwise um, when trying to dive into these topics. So yeah, it's, it's nerve wracking. It's daunting in a sense, but it's also like rewarding and liberating and freeing. It's hard because I know where I was at the time when I didn't want to say anything, but the weight I felt off my shoulders when I did finally say something um, and you're not gonna, you know, weigh other people down with problems. I think other people close to you can sense that there's something wrong. And if you don't tell them, you know, both of you are gonna be weighed down by this, you know, the stuff that's going on. So if you're open and honest, you're just gonna feel lighter, people around you, you know, and then you're not holding on to that energy that, you know, can be dispersed and, and helped. And that's probably my biggest thing is just to not so much think about putting stress onto other people but yeah relieving stress from from them and and you when I'm struggling now the most I go and spend some time to my myself away from any distractions and I kind of reflect on everything in my life that I do have everything that I can be grateful for gratitude is just so important to me because you know when you do lose so much you know you're you're grateful for what you have right now and really like, you know, sitting in myself and, and kind of, you know, spending some alone time and then going to share it with, you know, my loved ones and my family and tell them everything that was happening. That was, that's probably my way of, of going about it now. I think just as friends, as family, uh, it's letting people know those conversations are a safe space. So bringing up these topics at times where they're not necessarily needed so not only talking about mental health when it's clearly affected someone or when someone's struggling, but 
having these conversations and check-in points as part of your daily life, it's, it's kind of a routine, I think. We are getting better as people in the sense that we check in with ourselves and we have self-care practices, but we also need to be able to check in with our mates and have those talks and those conversations that may be harder, but could potentially be life-saving if intervened early enough. So just creating a culture in your circles that allows people to, yeah, talk about it. And as I said, management, not crisis response. I am so lucky. I really don't know I like I. I really don't know if I would still be here if I didn't have the people in my life that I do. Like, I'm. I've had this conversation with so many people. Like, I'm so fucking lucky. I I think it's not something that's ever over, right? Like you keep keep finding uh, new obstacles and new challenges and, and issues that you gotta face. And um, that's okay, because I think that that's the cool part about mental health. And um, you know, in the same way that physical health is something that you train and something that you can get better at, I think that mental health, there's a amazing ability for us to be able to, you know, train our minds to be able to experience emotions and, and feel all of the things that happen. One of the biggest lessons for me has been to not wait. Um, you know, life doesn't wait for anybody. Life keeps going on, the sun keeps shining, the world keeps spinning, you know, and potentially we're stuck feeling these same ways. And once you embrace that and embrace that journey, um, you know, that's, that's when all the real magic and all the real fun starts, but it really doesn't start until, until you say something and until you say, okay, I am going to feel this and, I, and, I, and it is okay that I'm feeling this and I'm going to go talk to somebody about it. I'm going to share this with my mom or my family or my friend or whoever it is. And, um, you know, in the same way that training isn't easy on day one and might make you want to quit in the early stages, like mental health is going to be the same way. You're, you're going to have challenges and things are not going to be easy. But every time that you talk about it and every time that you feel those emotions, it's going to make the next time that much better. But it, it's, it's too important. It's too important to wait. Mental health is going to be a constant in my life. We all experience it, whether it's positive mental health or poor mental health. And it fluctuates. It, it doesn't always have a reason for the fluctuation, but just knowing that it's something I'm going to have points to struggle with in my life again. So knowing that those tools are in place and those resources are there for me and there's people around me are gonna be able to pick me up when I need it is really important. And now I have that established that the people around you in your life, the ones in your inner circle, they just want the best for you. They're there to love you, support you, not judge you. And at the end of the day, they want you to be the best version of yourself. So don't wait. Every regret that I have from my life, it doesn't mean I necessarily change them all, but every regret that I have, every thing that I look back on and I'm like, now I wish I did things differently, can all be basically grouped into, I wish I had have done something to change, to make positive changes in my life sooner. I wish I had have started to manage my mental health seriously and consistently sooner. I wish I had a had conversations about what I was going through sooner. I think back, imagine in high school, I had, a, I, had a, I had a conversation with someone about what I was going through with my eating disorder or the body image issues that I had. How different my life could be now if that was the case. How many insecurities and you know trust issues and past traumas would I not have experienced if I had just said something and then yeah, like every single thing that I, I regret uh, from my life. I believe, I don't know if it would be fixed, but can go back to not doing something soon, not taking action sooner. And so, I don't know, like I think there's a lot that needs to happen around how we have conversations around mental health, but we need to have those conversations. We need to have those conversations that allow people to to find some place to speak up sooner. It's the, 
saying that the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. And I think in mental health, that single step is talking to somebody. That's almost like a good end up. I was like, was he in the way he or was, was he? He was in the shop, but you could still see you. Yeah. That was cool.